Welcome to Red Ice Radio. This is Henrik Palmgren. Thank you for stopping by. We have Lloyd Pai back with us on the program today. He is the caretaker of the Star Child Skull. He joins us for an update on what is believed to be the skull of a human-alien hybrid. And the question, of course, is, uh, is this the first physical evidence of ET and hominoid genetic tampering? Uh, there have been some new developments since we last talked with Lloyd. You might have heard the news that nuclear DNA now finally have been recovered from the skull. Uh, don't forget to go into our archive and check out our previous programs with Lloyd for the full background story. But Lloyd has some new exciting information to share with us about it today. His website is lloydpie.com, but also go to starchildproject.com for the main site about the skull itself. Welcome back to Red Ice Radio, Lloyd. It's uh, great to have you back on the program again. Great to be back, guys, and, and thank you for uh, for having me on again. I always always enjoy it. So tell us about the latest developments. What has been going on? I, I think that our uh, uh, listeners and those who follow our website have, have uh, followed the news as well, the fact that you guys have been able to uh, recover some of the nuclear DNA. But what does that mean for people who have uh, no clue of what we're talking about here, Lloyd? Well, first of all, let's let's make clear what the star child is for those few who might be listening who don't even know that. The, the, the star child skull is a real, true bone skull, no question about it, that has human-like characteristics, human-like shape, just a kind of a humanish look to it. But its parts are really, when you get down to it physiologically, it's not really human at all. It, 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 everything about its fundamental major portions are are not human so it's uh it's something that we've been working on for 11 years now trying to get technology that was capable of proving what we suspected about the skull that it, that some part of it is not human to prove that beyond all scientific doubt and the only way to do that was with dna so in 2003, we had a DNA test that was the, our first attempt to crack the genetic code of the star child. Now, people need to understand that there are two forms of DNA that you can test. There's mitochondrial DNA and there's nuclear DNA. The mitochondrial DNA floats in little capsules within the cytoplasm of our cells. The, a cell in, the cells in our bodies have the cell wall then they have the cytoplasm wrapped around a nucleus. Imagine just an egg. There, the nucleus is the yolk of the egg, and the cytoplasm is the white part of the egg. And floating around in there are little chips of nucleotides, which are called base pairs. And they're about 16,000 base pairs long. 16,000 base pairs long, mm -hmm. each of these little mitochondrial particles floating around. Inside the nucleus, though, inside the yolk, is all of, of, of beings, uh, nuclear DNA, what comes from both their parents. That's all 23 chromosomes from the mother and all 23 chromosomes from the father. All 3 billion base pairs are in the yolk. So imagine, get the numbers clear in your mind, three billion combined in the yolk in the nucleus, 16,000 floating around in each of the many mitochondria that float in the cytoplasm. So in 2003, when they attempted to recover the mitochondrial DNA, it was a very easy recovery. The star child's DNA is very fresh because it was, uh, it was buried in a mine tunnel for 900 years. So it wasn't degraded by weather or sun, water, any of that. And so it's really very well-preserved DNA, even for 900 years. So in the first run, they recovered the mitochondrial DNA, and it, that meant that it had a human mother because, and this is key, the mitochondrial DNA comes only from the female line. It passes down only from females, from mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, mm -hmm. right on back as far as you care to go. This female line's uh, mitochondrial DNA that all men carry and all women carry. Mm -hmm. But in the nucleus, again, as I said earlier, that comes from the mother and the father. So right away we knew that the star child had a human mother. So that was this equation right there in 203 and the geneticist said well now if we get a good clear recovery like we got for the nuclear DNA, then that means that 
and a human father, and you're looking at a you're looking at a deformity no matter what you think. So I said, okay, fire away. So they went after it, and they tried six full times, six times, and got no recovery. So once we had the mitochondrial DNA, and we knew that the mother was human, it was time to check for the nuclear DNA. And they said, you know, now that we know the mother's human, if we get a recovery here, it's going to mean that a, a human mother and a human father produce this, this being, and it's a deformity no matter what the physiology, the differences in the physiology say. And I said, okay, fine. We just want to get this over with, and we want to know the answer one way or the other. So they started testing for the nuclear DNA. And to their surprise, in six attempts, they were unable to recover any nuclear DNA. And so what that meant very clearly was that the father was not entirely human. But in 203, there was no way to say what he was. There was no way to prove what he might be. All we could say at that point is, we know he's not entirely human. But what science, the attitude they took is, you can't say this means that we have a, a non-human father here. Mm -hmm. All this means is that your, your geneticist could not recover the nuclear DNA. And what that says to us is, using Occam's razor, the simplest explanation, is your DNA is degraded in some unusual way that doesn't allow the primers to pick it up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, how, that's the attitude that science took. So while we all knew pretty much what it was, we had to play the game within the extremely restrictive rules of mainstream science because they don't let anything in. You, you know the old saying, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Mm -hmm. Well, we have one of the most extraordinary claims that you can make. And so we have to have proof of a level that is extraordinary beyond, you know, beyond, on, well beyond normal proof. Yeah. So we were just stuck. And so I, I asked the geneticists, what can we do? And they said, well, you're going to have to wait three to five years for a technology to come along that will allow for the recovery of the entire genome, all three billion base pairs, because all we have are these primers which are a few, several hundred to a few thousand base pairs long out of the three billion. In other words, the primers that were used to recover in 2003 were relatively small. So if technology would come along that would allow the recovery of the entire genome, then we could lay that down against the entire human genome, the entire chimp genome, gorilla genome, and, and soon Neanderthal genome. And we'll be able to say exactly, specifically, what percentage the star child was away from normal. Now, understand that the chimp is 97% the same as us. Its mm. whole genome, 97% the same, only 3% separates us from a chimp. 5% mm. separate us from a gorilla. So we were expecting the star child to be somewhere in that range. I, even if it was 1%, that would be significant because humans are all like, we're all 99.99% the same. Right. We're very, very much alike genetically. So if, if it was the star child proved to be 99%, that would be a strong indication that it 